All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our Weaving Asian Stories panel. Uh, my name is Daniel. I'll just do a quick introduction to who I am, and then we'll get into the panelists. Uh, I'm one of the co-hosts of the Asians Represent podcast. I'm a designer based in Toronto. Uh, I, a lot of my work revolves around my experiences as an archaeologist and as a Chinese-Canadian. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take it to our amazing panelists from all over the world. Uh, let's start with Steve. Steve, who are you? Why are you here? Why are you awesome? Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. My name is Steve <laughs> Nguyen. Uh, I am also streaming uh, from Toronto, Canada. I'm a Canadian Vietnamese uh, man. Uh, I am just recently a best-selling author in the Unbreakable RPG anthology for D&D 5e. Uh, otherwise, I'm just generally a tabletop RPG and D&D enthusiast, and I'm so happy to be here. I am also uh, one of the cast members of the Asian Represent crew. Yeah, and, and don't don't forget our like all of the streaming stuff that we, you you and I did, that that will kind of work as the foundation for this panel. But we're gonna get to that later. Let's let's get to our, our next panels. Amar, like tell us why you're awesome. <laughs> uh, that's very generous. Uh, my name is Amar. Uh, he him. I'm one of the co-hosts of the uh, Any Winning uh, podcast. Asians represent. I'm also one of the cast members of uh, Dungeons and Da Asians, uh, which was one of my coinings because I like my terrible wordplay. Uh, and I'm going to be. Uh, I'm also facilitating the Al Kadim, uh, the critical read uh, of Al Kadim. Uh, so we're going to be talking about that today too. Hey, and then our next one, Pam. Coming, coming from like, it's like 4 a.m. where you are. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I'm Pam Ponsalan. I am a designer based in Metro Manila, Philippines. So yes, it is four in the morning, uh, but I'm happy to join everybody. I'm part of the admin team for Asians Represent. So the Discord was kind of my child and then everything kind of like launched in from there. I do a lot of design work primarily about the fact that I am a queer woman based in the Philippines and that I have some experiences due to the fact that I grew up in Canada. So a lot of my games are about queerness, intimacy, diaspora, and weird stuff. Um, one of my games right now is Sundo, We Once Mortal, where you play angels of death. Uh, that's kind of my aesthetic as obvious from the purple hair. Uh, I also am one of the point persons for RPGC. So if you want to ask any questions about South Southeast Asia and the tabletop scene, I'm probably one of the people you want to talk to. I've also contributed to some major stuff and I grew up uh, playing D&D for a really long time. So I'm really happy to be doing this. Yeah, that, and that's RPG SEA, not RPG C, RPG <laughs> for all of those who are tuning in and aren't familiar with it. Um, and then in another part of the world, we have Ahmed. Ahmed, who are you and what are you doing? You're doing some important work. Hi, I'm Ahmed Al Jabri. I am talking to you from Jeddah in Saudi Arabia. I translate and uh, expand the community for D&D &D between Arabs and non-Arabs. And I try to break cultural barriers for those who want to incorporate Arabic culture and Islamic uh, ideas into their setting and vice versa. Yeah, and, and you've played like an important role and an important perspective in our Critical Read al Qadim series. And it's just like, you know, like one Saturday a month, it's just incredible to learn from you and learn from Amar. Um, so before we get started, I know our time is super limited. I kind of want to go over, you know, what this panel is all about. Um, the point of this panel, Weaving Asian Stories, is to introduce new perspectives into the D&D community, uh, engage in constructive conversation, and, you know, try to make sure that that constructive conversation continues. And then, of course, you know, create a space for Asian voices in the D&D space. Um, I really like to think that, you know, stories are like people. You could really love them. But that doesn't make them perfect, no matter like how much you try to overlook their flaws. Uh, a little, you know, earlier on in this quarantine, when everything kind of changed for the world, uh, Steve and I kind of had this idea. Um, we had this idea that we would try to read through the AD&D Oriental Adventures Handbook, and we would stream this on our Twitch channel. Um, and it kind of turned into a long 26-hour ordeal where we invited Asian creators from around the world to kind of experience this text with us from our different perspectives. Um, and so what we kind of want to do today is talk about the legacy of those products, of Oriental Adventures, of al -Qadim. But we want to provide you folks with solutions on how to move forward, how to move beyond these things. But in order to do that, there are a couple of things that we have to do. We have to talk about, you know, our foundational perspectives on these and the frameworks that, you know, these books maybe unintentionally use um, to cause harm to the Asian community. So first and foremost, I want to lay out that, you know, Oriental Adventures and Alcadim 
are products that serve as an escapist fantasy, primarily designed for people who, who don't look like us. Um, these things also, you know, there are elements of these books that are actually features that are of the Western world or of the European world, but are overemphasized or exoticized in an Eastern setting. Um, our friend Adam Ali, who's also a part of the Critical Read Al Qadim series, um, says that you know, he likes to say that these cultures are created in opposition. Right? Um, and then, of course, you know, these books use stereotypes and tropes without really thought of consequence. Um, now, when we do all of our readings, when we're reading through, you know, older D&D material, and we're reading through 5th edition D&D material, because I know a lot of you out there are probably like, wait a second, Oriental Adventures and Al Godim, those are AD&D books. Those were published in the 80s. Why are we talking about them now? Um, don't worry, we're going to get to that. Um, now, when we're, whenever we're approaching books like this, uh, we kind of like to approach it with the framework of four things. One, world building is based on harmful real world stereotypes or reductive blendings of cultures, ethnic groups, or even time periods. Now, this isn't the result of like racism or malicious intent, uh, but rather an example of how appreciation of cultural stereotypes can result in a tool for creating an other. Um, this is really harmful and problematic um, as, you know, placing certain themes in prominent positions actually conveys the importance of tropes to the reader who might not actually know about these cultures. Um, so really, our goal is to educate you folks and educate the broader community. Now, our second point is that these books and portrayals of Asian cultures and Asian characters um, are often viewed through the lens of violence and savagery. Uh, three... Asians are often depicted as uncivilized or in need of saving. That's, that kind of goes back to this othering. And four, Asians are viewed as objects of fetishization. Now, I kind of want to go to the panel and I want to ask a question. And I, I put this in our notes, uh, but I also didn't tell you folks that I was going to ask you this question. I want to ask you folks, what's a stereotype to you? Because there are a lot of people who are like, oh, there are, there are tons of stereotypes out there. Uh, some of them are good. Some of them are bad. Right. Um, but but what is the stereotype to you and how do these stereotypes kind of affect how we interact with game material? And like, feel free to just chime in whenever you have an answer. Um, I've got one, but I didn't want to jump in first. <laughs> yeah, well, I jump in here first. So it, it stereotype itself is a super loaded word and, and as it gets used over and over again in media. Um, it's very easy to kind of lose sight of the impact that it can have and it's going to change meaning based on context and all that good stuff. But from a point blank, if you're just gonna ask me, what's the stereotype, Steve? What I'm gonna say is that I think it is a symptom of a, something that's very human, where people want to just take patterns that they see and categorize them, put labels on them. Generally, if you have stereotypes in like, you know, media, which we just call tropes at that point, no real harm is done. However, when your stereotype or your trope uh, applies to real people, their lived experiences and their identity, then you begin kind of meandering into this area where you can actually take a lot of their identity, what makes them feel unique and feel special and feel individual, and you can begin to erase it. So for me, a stereotype when it is in the context of a person is a way to conveniently erase uh, some of their identity um, for whoever happens to be making that stereotype. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, totally. You know, stereotypes kind of act in a way where they're driven for our desires for simplicity and to differentiate individuals, but they also erase a lot of nuance. And they erase a lot of the nuance that actually put, put these things into context. Um, I think one of the, the common stereotypes that we see in sort of Eastern themed like D&D &D or other TTRPGs is that all Asians eat rice. Like that's a big one, <laughs> Yeah. right? But when, but when you look at, you know, Asia in general, or from my perspective, as, you know, a scholar of this, um, you look at rice and you'd be like, you know, there are parts of Asia where you can't even grow rice. Um, rice isn't a part of the cuisine. Yet in books, we see people talk about how like, oh, have you eaten rice today being a common greeting? And I mean, that's where you take these stereotypes and, you know, create these sort of negative pictures of people. Does anybody else have any uh, ideas of or anything that they want to contribute to this idea of what a stereotype is? Because this is an important framing tool for us uh, for when we go into you know the fifth edition world of D and D. I think I think I've got something. Uh, a stereotype 
is also something grounded in common sense or what we call common sense. But what we do not realize very often is that common sense is formed by many things around us. So if you're surrounded by multiple stories, your common sense common sense will naturally be informed by different perspectives. But if you happen to be in a single location uh, where there is an astounding majority of a certain gender, religion, or race, then your common sense gets formed by sensibilities of other people that may be carrying their own harmful ideas of another person or another train of thought. So the goal here with a stereotype is recognizing um, who showed you what that is supposed to be like according to them and what is it actually like by listening to the person involved in the stereotyping or the person who is being stereotyped. So it is all about challenging your so-called common sense and then learning from other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, if I can jump in here with that a uh, little bit, uh, uh, I, I studied psychology and, and philosophy uh, primarily. And one of the things I want to uh, emphasize here is stereotypes aren't neutral. They aren't just descriptions of the world and, oh yeah, okay, I mean, maybe sort of, you know, some Asian folk do eat a lot of rice and that's true. It's actually, once you accept a stereotype, you are blind to new information coming in that might contradict that. So you start taking the information that's coming in and putting it into the one box that you know, and thereby missing the depth and richness of the specific individual or the specific individual culture that you're actually interacting with. Yeah, and we, we totally see this with, with a lot of world building. Um, Ahmed, how about you? Do you have anything that you want to add to this? Yeah, it's uh, one of my uh, most annoying things is just how they end up grouping us all together. Like for me, because yeah. I am an Arab and I am a Muslim, so because I'm an Arab, I'm Middle Eastern, so I'm probably Indian as well. I am, they mix me with Persians and sometimes with Turkish people. And then because I'm Muslim, so I am looped in the same group with uh, even Malay, Indonesian people all the way there and North Africa and mid Africa. So there's so much to go around and then just smooshed together into one label, which is, <laughs> really annoying because you're missing out on so much yeah and, that, and that's the thing i think we're we're not here to tell you what you can't put in your game we're trying to help you sort of make your game richer make your worlds more interesting and nuanced and help you make characters that can tell more complex stories right and i, and I think that's a big thing we're not we're not here to police your game we're here to help you make your game better so i want us to go to and i know this is very recently on Amar and Ahmed's minds because of the readings that you're doing right now. Um, but I want to talk about what are the biggest stereotypes that we see in D&D and how it fits into 5e, okay? Um, and how we can move past this and, uh, and why this can be harmful. So in the Dungeon Master's Guide, there is an optional rule. There are two optional rules there. Uh, one for sanity, which we're going to disregard. Um, but there is one for honor. Okay. And the text reads as such, if your campaign involves cultures where a rigid code of honor is part of daily life, consider using the honor score as a means of measuring a character's devotion to that code. This ability fits well in a setting inspired by Asian cultures, such as Karatur and the Forgotten Realms. Um, so let's talk about that. And I know like depictions of honor are found in almost every East Asian game and not just D&D. Um, but here we're seeing an example of a stereotype being applied to all Asian people. But, but for me, the big thing about honor, and I'm going to get to where the Dungeon Master's Guide actually does something right, um, is that the idea is that honor is everywhere. The idea of loyalty, the idea of devotion, the idea of a code of morals is, is found, is, is a human experience. And this is sort of a, a, the perfect example of how we see a feature that's found in other parts of the world overemphasized in an Eastern setting, where they're used to create this other, this other half of the world. Um, now, in the Dungeon Master's Guide, it does say that the honor ability in the next sentence, it says the honor ability is also useful in any campaign that revolves around orders of knights. It's a solid move. The only thing there 
that, you know, that I would comment on is that, you know, while the book does note that honor can be found in other parts of the world, the text makes a blanket statement about Asian cultures, but then says that this can also apply to a particular socioeconomic group. Um, and we've seen, you know, honor kind of used in other, you know, Asian cultures, like in Al-Qadim, where they have some, you know, more harmful stereotypes about honor rather than being, you know, rigid code of duty. There's, there's a little more to it in, in other books. I don't know if Amara or Ahmed, you want to comment on that. Ahmed, do you want to take this one? Sure. Um, like having something like such a concept becoming a mechanic and this is, for me, this is part of my daily life. This is how I treat people. This is how I behave every day. The idea of honor is on our minds all the time. But it's not the way that is portrayed in the uh, media. It, it is about being a good person. It is about being uh, good to people around you. And I think this mentality should be not quantified like it should not be a mechanic it's a, it's a role play aspect it's a, a moment in the game that you build up to it's not just points to add up and remove from yeah everybody has honor and when you make it a game mechanic or a simple game mechanic like that you kind of strip it of all that nuance right and, and i know there was there was recently there was a twitter feed on the use of love and camaraderie and companionship in D D. There was a big discussion about whether or not that should be, you know, mechanized or created with a structure or, or not. Um, and I know that's not what this panel is about. Um, but we saw there with that conversation about love and camaraderie that there are a lot of different perspectives at play here. There are people who view love very differently from one another. Um, so I, I, I personally would want that same conversation to happen about honor as well. Yeah, you can uh, you can point it out as a simple thing. Like, what is the honorable thing to do? Is to uh, do what is right by the culture or the by the law of the community or do what is right by yourself? Which one is the honorable one? It's, it's hard to mechanize something like that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's, yeah, it, sorry if I can jump in here for a sec. Uh, maybe if we change terms a little bit. Uh, I prefer the term reputation. Reputations exist, it's just a fact of yeah. being a person in society. Um, here, even though I'm sort of living in Toronto and I'm living in Canada, which I, I love, uh, but my reputation still matters. I don't need an honor score to talk about how people think about me at work or if I was an adventurer, how people kind of think about me. It's just not necessary. It's a way that is, uh, it's taking one small part of a culture and uh, expanding it out uh, in order to exoticize that culture and in many ways other that culture. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd also like to jump in really quick about the whole honor conversation, which I also had with uh, Daniel and Steve before. Um, just to give a bit of context, the Oriental Adventure is completely uh, renders Southeast Asia invisible. And Southeast Asia is a very large part of Asia and each one of those countries is extremely different from the other. And yet, consistently throughout books. And this isn't just about Oriental adventures. This is about books and tabletop in general. We do not exist. And each one of our countries has its own version of what you could approximate to be honor. For example, in the Philippines, uh, we have a term called delicadeza, which is about how do you socially maneuver things so that A, you get what your family needs, B, what you get what you need, and C, you get what you need in a socially acceptable fashion to everybody else in your community. Uh, those are three layers, and I'm already like grossly minimizing it, but how do you mechanize that as well, especially if you are an outsider trying to write about my country? Where do you even begin to impact, uh, to deal with the, the intersections of uh, the Philippines as a Southeast Asian country and then the Philippines as a Catholic country uh, that has a history of other countries coming in and determining what the Philippines is to them? And then how do you deal as well with the layer of the Philippines as it is now? and where all of that intersects and how do you 
even begin to design that. Like I'd feel very uncomfortable with somebody trying to gamify that if you don't begin to understand the intricacies of how we do social maneuvering here and what reputation means to us and what honor supposedly is on our end. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even on a, on a lighter note, yesterday, like Amar and Ahmed, you two and, and the rest of like the Critical Read Al-Kadzim crew had this like really funny conversation about, you know, all of the characters wandering around Sahara and worrying about running into family members and worrying about all of the different social <laughs> obligations that they had to their family members. And these are things that you just don't see in, in, in games in general. Um, okay, so we, we've kind of talked about, about honor, and we can, and I literally know that we could go on for <laughs> hours and hours and hours, um, but I don't want to dwell on that. I want to dwell on how we can move forward. I want to, you know, get us to the point where we provided you, the audience, with tips and tricks on, you know, you know, what's, what's just not right and what you could do to move forward and what is done right. Um, so I know that, um, I know that Ahmed has some stuff on Zahara. I want to quickly just go over this thing about Karatur because Karatur is mentioned. Um, and this is kind of one of the problems that we've had in the past with these old legacy titles in that, you know, you don't have to use Oriental Adventures, AD&D, or 3rd Edition. You don't have to use those books. But um, in this honor section, this optional rule where it says this ability fits well in a setting inspired by Asian cultures such as Karatur, it kind of draws the reader's attention to that place, Karatur. And what is Karatur? And how does Karatur exist in 5th Edition? Um, in the Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide, uh, it says, Far to the east, past the wastes of the Horde lands, lie the empires of Sholung, Kozakura, Wa, and the other lands of the vast continent of Karatur. To most people in Faerun, Karatur is like another world, and the tales told by travelers of its nations seem to confirm it. The gods that humans worship in Faerun are unknown there, as are common peoples, such as gnomes and orcs. Other dragons, neither chromatic nor metallic, dwell in its lands and fly its skies. And its mages practice forms of magic, mysterious even to arch wizards of Faerun. Stories of Karatur tell of gold and jade in great abundance, rich spices, silks, and other goods, rare or unknown in Western lands. So within one paragraph, we see some good and we see some, I'm not going to say bad, but we see some things that could be improved upon. The good here for me is that sentence where it says, the gods that humans worship in Faerun are unknown there, as are the common people such as gnomes and orcs. Um, it's kind of taking these European aspects of D&D &D and removing them from the Asian aspects of D&D, &D, creating a more culturally relative perspective of Asia. But then it kind of says these mages practice forms of magic mysterious even to the archwizards of Faerun. Now, mysterious magics isn't bad, but this is where there's this added layer of this mystical Asia trope, the, the wise Asian mentor to a usually white character. Um, the magical Asian exists as a, as a pop culture trope um, to dispense lessons to non-Asian characters using, well, the wisdom of their people. Um, so this, this is something that we see all the time, these sort of broad descriptions of a very, very diverse people. Um, I don't know, Ahmed or Amar, did you want to read the description of Zahara in 5th edition from the Sword Coast Adventures Guide? Uh, I'm happy to take it, unless, Ahmed, you have a... Go ahead. Far to the south of Faerun, beyond Kalimshan, sorry, I don't think I know that one before, and even the jungles of Khluk, are the lands of fate, surrounded by waters thick with pirates and corsairs, and this is I'm underlying things, uh, Sahara is a place less hospitable than most, but still braved by travelers who hope to profit, profit from its exotic goods and strange magics. Like Karatur, putting a, a note in that for a pin in that for a second too, Sahara seems like a world away from Feyrunians. It is thought of as a vast desert sprinkled with 
glittering cities like scattered gems. Romantic tales abound of scimitar-wielding rogues riding flying carpets and of genies bound in service to humans. Their mages, Kalchair, practice their magic with the aid of genies, and it is said might carry the lineage of those elemental beings in their blood. Yeah. So I'm just going to go back and comment on the one piece right now, which is like Karatur, <laughs> which is to say there's a lumping together of all the exotic places uh, to get, even though they're supposedly drawn from very different cultures from all over the world. That, that just stood out to me right away. Uh, yeah. Ahmed, do you want to say anything? Because I, I know that you're actually in this very interesting position where you are translating the al Qadim Arabian Adventures source book and using it with members of your community. So how do you, how do you approach that? Like, I, it's something I'm very curious about. Uh, it's more, it's not translation. It's more of uh, trying to readapt it right. to fit our narrative a little bit. Uh, overall, like the actual source books are filled with treasure troves. But at the same time, you find things like hoping to profit from exotic goods and strange magic. So the the invitation doesn't feel very uh, welcoming. You are going there to plunder, basically. Yeah, and, and we've so, seen in these books there's there's good stuff, like you said, there are treasures, but you kind of have, yeah. kind of have to weed through other things. Exactly. So I think like the intention, I can see it, and I can see the work that is done. I am amazed by how much detail they managed to pick up and put together in different books. But the presentation needed a little bit more attention to make sure, like we said before, the othering and the exotization of uh, other people. It's We're not just exotic goods and strange magic. It's the whole uh, generalization of that is, I don't know, it's, it's belittling a little bit. Like mm. we have so much to offer as a culture, we have history, we have so many things instead of just goods and magic. Yeah, and, and I know there are, there are going to be people who are in the chat who are wondering, genies and Ganassi, are they are they are they okay? What do I do with these? I, I also would like to know because that is not a culture that you know I have lived experience with. And I know, that, like in our well, notes, you you put a whole thing on genies and Ganassi. Yeah, I mentioned uh, something from the uh, Monster Manual. It touches on the genies, and there is uh, one section about the Marids. It talks about, be, uh, first of all, the genies, they want to be rule or be ruled. So as a, a mythical creature so far, I don't have an issue with that. Uh, making them evil, uh, all about slavery and all these things, so far so good. But then when we go to the Marid, we hit on the titles that uh, they are egotistical hierarchs. All marids claim a title of nobility, and the race is awash in shahs, sultans, muftis, and khadivs. Mm. On their own, they are basically labelizing this culture that these titles come from. Like in the setting where Al Qadim is, where everybody is using these titles. I would say it makes sense, but now you took it out of context and you pr put it somewhere else and you're still using the same titles from that culture. So it feels like uh, all these images now, all the bad images that you put on the bad genies are now also labeled on the people these cultures are, and these titles are coming from. Yeah, no, totally. I, I think it's, it's a really good point and I, I, I'd love to know like Pam's perspective as well on the idea of monsters, the idea of the monstrous, the unknown, the, the weird, and how, you know, they are viewed in games like D&D, how they are, you know, often viewed in an adversarial relationship with, you know, the players. And like, so how do you take like, so Southeast Asian or, or you know, monsters <laughs> from the Philippines and, and put that into something like D&D? Well, I think uh, one of the things that I wanted to bring up, especially after listening to the stream so far, is a perspective that may be helpful for people to recognize is the idea that in the way that the old books were written, they constantly say, 
one message. The other is bad. The other is scary. The, and also, the other can be conquered. That is the underlying message in all of these older books. And that is a form of, of colonization. And for it would be good to remember that when you're dealing with cultures that are not your own, you can see things from those people and that they are lived experiences, that they have their own history, and that they have their own voice. Especially if you are, and I'll, I'll get a little real here, especially if you are a country where at one point in history, you directly benefited from the exploitation of that other country. So the Philippines, for example, has um, a colonial history of Spain and even Britain and also Japan for a brief time and America. Mm -hmm. That is a history of four different cultures coming in uh, to this wonderful other land and basically assuming that we are monsters that must be defeated or civilized. Uh, so I think that's, I guess that would be my perspective on the whole idea of making something monstrous in a weird way by building it up to be something strange and something new. You are also ex implicitly telling the other person on, on the end that eventually you can defeat that person or that thing that you've mm -hmm. created and you can exploit it, you can hunt it down, you can take its riches and you can learn for it for your own benefit, not for theirs, but for yours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, we see that in sort of Chinese mythology and legend and folklore as well. Um, monsters are you know, creatures that exist just kind of beyond the realm of human understanding. Or the appearance of monsters is just how people have I interpreted nature. And they don't exist as sort of these moral adversaries or representations of, of evil or good. That, that kind of concept of how alignment doesn't really go with a lot of Asian mythologies, the, the idea of D&D's alignment. Um, but I want to move on, and I want to ask you folks, unless, Steve, you have anything to, to say about this idea of monsters. We have very limited time. So. My, my, my brain's buzzing, but Daniel, can you <laughs> point? I'll, I'll, I'll definitely take it and speak. But <laughs> if I were to condense my thoughts down, there was a great blog post from Throne of Salt about monsters, and, and it was framed with these old stories that you would, you would hear about lions and tigers like assaulting and, and killing villagers that uh, that were basically British colonies. Um, and, you know, there was just like this, for the people there, it was like a monster in the night. It would just like take people and there was no stopping it. And it would like outsmarted all of the, the British people, uh, never fell into any traps, all that and whatnot. But the article then takes a change and says, actually, you know, as we studied this, we found that these animals were riddled with bullets. Um, in fact, a lot of their teeth were knocked out uh, by the bullets and they were starving. They couldn't catch their normal prey. They were desperate. And so they, they did whatever they had to do to survive. They weren't monsters. They were a product of colonialism. And the article then goes on to say, all monsters that we as human beings in real life talk about, there is a cause for them. We want to tell stories. And these monsters are just a framework for which to tell those stories. And it, it almost always is not so nuanced as they are beings of evil to be defeated. There's usually something else there. And in, and there is the richness of the stories that we want people to be empowered to tell, I think. Yeah, there's a really cool creature. And here and here's like a free one if you want to use this in your adventures. There's um, a creature called a mingxia. It's a, it's a kind of snake in Chinese folklore. It's kind of known as like a chiming or a sound snake. And they're tiny little snakes that have four bird wings. And they live in mountains that have rich jade and gold deposits. And when they open their mouths to speak, it actually sounds like chiming bells. Um, adventurers or explorers in ancient China often associated with them as, you know, signals of nearby treasure. Now, I think it would be so narratively interesting if you had an adventure where you had to actually, you know, find a relic made of jade. And in order to do that, you needed to find and perhaps capture or befriend a Mingxia and have it use its natural affinity for these riches uh, to locate something. But when you assign ideas of good or evil um, to a creature like this, that really has the same relationship that we have with 
animals outside of our homes. Um, you limit the kind of stories you can tell with them, right? And there are certainly creatures that have inherent evil, but not all of them do. Um, so that being said, like, what are some resources for, for all of the panelists? What are some resources out there that you might recommend to somebody, a fifth edition resource, or even like a book, like a, like a textbook or, or a work of fiction that you might recommend to people to help them, well, weave Asian stories or serve as a foundation or a really good example of what can be done? Um, I, Steve, do you have one? I know, I know you've written one. Yeah. So let's, <laughs> let's go right to Unbreakable RPG, uh, the anthology that's available on Drive-Thru RPG. It is a uh, anthology of one-shot adventures for D&D 5e, uh, all written uh, and illustrated by Asian creators. Um, this is not going to give you a setting, and I know that's often kind of the, the question we get uh, as we do this kind of content. You know, how can I make character or a more inclusive setting? But if, if you take those adventures, even just one of them, and just critically read through how they're constructed, you're going to start seeing a lot of that nuance that we always talk about. As an example, if you were to go through uh, the Vietnamese-inspired settings, you'll see there's a lot of focus on food. Um, and I've talked about this in the past, and I, I really should talk more about it more. But food, culture, identity, they're all inseparable. And if you look at these adventures and you look about how they talk about food and where food appears, you're going to start to understand kind of its place in the overall cultural identity and the, the overall society that we're trying to tell you about. And it's done in a very nuanced uh, way that players can, if they so choose, really, really, really engage with. Or if it's not really for them, you know, it's food at the end of the day. They can eat it and move on. So yeah. I would say that if you're looking for that kind of, how can I do this better? Take a look at Unbreakable RPG and, and truly, truly try to read the text that's there. Yeah, I mean, like, I, I love that you brought up food. I mean, one of my favorite things to do when, you know, I'm playing a game, whether it be set in North America or it's set in a fantasy world, is like, well, what does the food look like? And I love thinking about that uh, because it really gets you to think about, A, like, geography, because let, let's really think about people's relationships with food and their ideals towards food. Um whether there are restrictions on what you can consume or whether there are only certain kinds of crops that you can grow. Thinking about food and, or even having food as a starting point can serve as such a cool way to flesh out your narrative. For instance, if you think about like Asia and you think about spicy food, you think about, well, why would people want to eat the spicy food? Why do people want that numbing spice uh, of like Western China? What would that help with? Maybe they live in a region that's really cold. Uh, or, or maybe that's all that grows and the people there are hardy and can handle these spices. Um, or maybe they use it as a medicine. Um, there are a lot of really cool things to talk about with food. Um, Amar, do you have anything that, that you would recommend to people, be it uh, like a D&D &D 5e book or, or, or even just like a textbook or anything like that? Yeah, so I'm going to throw out the, the big tome of this stuff, not a D&D &D, uh, <laughs> resource or tabletop role-playing resource. Uh, it's Orientalism uh, by Edward Said. It's the foundational text of post-colonial studies. Uh, and once you read that book, a lot of what it's about is exactly the tropes. And you start, once you kind of go through the book, and it's, it's, it's a big one, it's a bit of a, a, a trek. But after you go through it, you recognize all of these tropes in the way these stories have been told for hundreds of years, and frankly, have gotten kind of boring. You can, using that, then nuance out the way that you tell stories uh, about different cultures, uh, and also how you avoid running into the same old tropes, which at this point is leading to kind of boring storytelling, frankly. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the big things about Orientalism is it talks about power and perspective and i think those are so important and i think one of the things that we're trying to encourage you folks to do is you know with the right preparation and resources um and conversations about safety um is we want to encourage you folks if you want to interact with asian cultures and things like that try playing as asian characters and, and that's a big thing try playing as asian characters instead of outsiders um, from the West in an Asian setting. Uh, and that will really change how you interact with the world and the kind of stories you, you weave together. Uh, Pam, what are some resources that you would recommend to people? 
Okay, well, Orientalism is the book. Uh, I will second that, especially since it not only talks about power, it also talks about exotification. So you get a deeper understanding of the big scary term cultural appropriation by starting from that point exactly. But on the end of game stuff, I would like to introduce two games to people, uh, or rather two game settings. One is called... Uh, uh, Lauren Song of The Bachelor by ZXU. He is a Malaysian designer, and that is a fantastic adventure set in a Southeast Asian-inspired world. And what's wonderful about it is that, if I remember correctly, it is system agnostic, so you can look at it as a source of inspiration. And if you're looking for something new, or if you're looking to begin to understand one of the many Southeast Asian perspectives, that is a, a book to look at. It is available, I think, on Itch, and I think it is also under sale from uh, Hydra Co-op. Then there is also a game from uh, the Philippines, or sorry, a system agnostic game again, by BJ Resho. It is called Cockamania. It is about cockfighting, and it is set in a small town in the Philippines. So that'll give you a good perspective on uh, something that that is from our end of things. So you have two uh, Southeast Asian perspectives already there. And of course, the third, if you are active on Twitter, and I know that this is a bit of self-promotion, but I firmly believe that if you really want to learn something about any kind of culture and any kind of body of people, you have to listen to them first. And one really good way of listening to Southeast Asia is to check the RPGC hashtag on Twitter. You will get people from Malaysia, Indonesia, the Philippines. I think there are even some people in Thailand and, and Vietnam using it. All of us like to talk about decolonization. All of us share our perspectives and all of us share our games. That would be one of the best ways to reach us. And it would also be one of the best ways to understand us. Many of us are also friendly. We like to uh, talk and yammer a lot about our, our what we're thinking and what we're feeling. And some of us post cats and animals if you're into that. So I, I think <laughs> I would recommend those things. And in addition to that, I also recommend like Thousand Thousand Islands. Yes. yes so in yeah, so nice. incredible. Again, system agnostic, <laughs> just beautiful. I, I bought them all and I was like, this is this is mind blowing. Mind blowing. Um, for those of you who are looking for something more fifth edition, what I would and you want to learn more about, you know, Southeast Asia and how to incorporate that stuff. There's also the islands of Sina Una, uh, another like amazing product. Oh yeah, I'm working on that. Yeah. Yeah, I was like, why did you yes. why did you mention that? <laughs> um, another great product that that I like highly highly recommend. Um, uh, Ahmed, what about you? What is something that you recommend and why? I, I know this is a tough question. Uh, can I yeah. jump in and recommend oh, yeah. following Ahmed's uh, Twitter because it, for all of the same reasons that Pam said, uh, Ahmed is doing some really really great stuff. I I grew up in the Middle East. My background is. Uh, Pakistani, but I, I was born and raised in Saudi Arabia, and I have been learning so much about that that history and the culture from his Twitter. Strong recommend. So I know he's not going to do it. <laughs> I think I think uh, ev you should you. Oh, everyone here follow everyone here. Don't worry about me. Follow everyone else here. Um, <laughs> follow Daniel. No, <laughs> Ahmed. How about how about you? What do you recommend? So uh, first of all, unfortunately, we don't have a plethora of sources to find in English. Most of the things that are specifically Arab culture, there was not much effort into translating in, uh, into English. But uh, a lot of things that uh, are Islamic that captured some aspects of uh, Arab culture, like, for example, the uh, there is a book called The Sealed Niktar. It's a... Uh, uh, like a biography of the Prophet Muhammad, but the first chapter of it it describes the socio uh, the socio structure of the Arab uh, Peninsula before he came to uh, being a prophet. Uh, and of course, there are a lot of people who are playing tabletop RPGs, and they would love to geek out about their culture. And our community is amazing. We are growing every day. And you can find so many people just talk in the on Twitter and you'll find a lot of Arabs reaching out to you. It's yeah. the most important thing is that, especially for our culture, because we get mixed up with other things. So it's best just to reach out to us. Yeah, there and there are so many amazing scholars also talking about like, you know, their folklore, their mythology, their religion. And I think that's a really good point you make, Ahmed, just talking to people talking to people, um, and going out, go into your local college or university and talking to the anthropology department, the history department, you know, 
email them. I know I won't, I won't encourage people to go to talk to other people in person, but go to the mosque. <laughs> yeah. Or go to a mosque. I, I think one of, you know, for me, my first real encounters with Islam was when I was actually living and working in Jordan. And I went to a mosque and I heard the call to prayer throughout the day. And it completely changed my, you know, my understanding of it. And I, I have this incredible deep appreciation for it, even though, you know, I don't practice that religion. Um, for, for, for me, a couple of things that I would recommend. The first one is actually going to be a, a textbook, one that you can find pretty readily online. Um, and it's called The Formation of Chinese Civilization. Now, there are a lot of authors who have written about China, but there is one, a legendary scholar, uh, the first Chinese archaeologist who actually went to America to study American archaeological theory and bring it back to China. And his name was Casey Chang. And he wrote this incredible book. It's it's like two players' handbooks thick. And it's just on the formation of Chinese civilization from the Neolithic all the way up into the late Bronze Age and early Iron Age in China. And it is one of the most incredible books if you are looking for interesting takes on Chinese magic, religion, but also the tools of war. Um, really great book or anything he's written is just incredible. Uh, from like a game resource perspective, I mean, again, I'll have to shout out Unbreakable as well. Um, but I actually have something that I put out and I started doing this recently because like Pam said, you know, I think it's important that we uplift each other and ourselves. Um, and so I put out two zines and I'm working on a third one called The Denizens of Mountains and Seas. And they are essentially um, two very short monster manuals featuring uh, Chinese creatures uh, with historical annotations and cultural annotations and how to best use them in your adventures. Um, now, we've provided some tools and I know we're, we're running out of time. We've provided some tools on how to best kind of create these worlds. And this is not an end all be all conversation. Like, like Ahmed said, we need to still talk to people. We need to, you know, talk to other members of the community. Cause I'm looking in the Twitch chat and there are so many amazing people in there who do a lot of great work. And I wish all of them could be in this conversation with us. Um, because we don't represent all Asians. That's so important to say, so important. Um, but I want to ask all of you, we have our world, we have our inspiration, we have our adventures, or we've read Orientalism and we know what we don't want to have in our world or how we want our world to be perceived. But what do you do if you're a player? What do you do for your character? And this is a super loaded question, but how do you play an Asian character? Is there a way? I don't think there is a, a, a single way to play an Asian character. But I'll start with my one tip, and I've already seen this in the chat, and I'm so thankful that there is one, and it's don't do the accent. <laughs> don't don't do the accent as much as you want to you know be uncle roger in your D, D game shout out to uncle roger um don't do the accent that's that's my thing that's my thing i think um i tell this story about my my mother buying me a copy of oriental adventures when i was a kid being like oh i found an asian D, &D thing my mom not knowing and i remember reading through that book and just never using it. And the reason why I never used it was because, well, my characters were always Asian to begin with. Um, so I don't know about the rest of you. For me, it's just like, don't use the accent. Actually, there's so much to unpack about accents. And I'm going to, yeah. I'm the host now, Daniel. Daniel, why oh. is the accent so harmful in your opinion? If you want to give some more to that. Well, I mean, it just creates those, the once again, those broad generalizations of how people talk. I mean, if you're listening to this in audio format and you've just tuned in, you're like, wait, are these people Asian? You might not know. Um, we all don't speak. We all don't look the same. We all don't eat the same food. We all don't speak the same. We all have distinct mannerisms. And, you know, to say we all speak in one stereotypical way would just do a huge disservice to everyone at your table, right? Um, it also makes you look kind of silly. Um, so for me, that's just like, just don't do the accent because one of the things you should be focusing on is the other aspects of being an Asian character. You know, what do you believe in? What are your ideals? What are your bonds? What are your flaws? These are all things that are already built into fifth edition. And these are all things that you need to consider. What do you believe in? What holds you back? What 
you know, puts you at odds with the other members of your party? Could it be your devotion to family? Could it be your love of food? Could it be your love mm -hmm. of spice when everybody else can't handle spice? How do you share foods when you're adventuring if all you have is spicy food? That's a serious problem, by the way. <laughs> um, so, like, I know, Steve, you asked a question, but but how do you play an Asian character? What would, what would you, you know, tell people? I think if I was asked this question by someone, I would say, I'm not a big person with textbooks or, or novels, even. Um, that's who I am. I'm big into movies, I'm into TV shows. And I would say there is so much available now now on Netflix, uh, Amazon Prime, all these streaming services. And you can watch filmmakers tell you Asian stories and you can get a very like, in like the lizard brain type like connection with other people who are just different than you. So if you watch like Train to Bouchon, if you watch Alive, if you watch Kingdom, you're getting like the sense of like what people from a Korean culture, what they value, what they fear and like the tensions that they experience and as you consume that media, you're going to make connections in your brain. You're going to be like, my experience is kind of like that. It's a little bit different, of course, but I can make those connections. And as you begin making those connections, as your brain gets wrinkled and wrinkled, it's going to give you the tools you need to tell Asian stories in a more nuanced and human way. And I think at the end of the day, that's, that's really, I think, a really beautiful thing if you can get closer to that. I don't think... Um, you'll ever get 100% of the way where you're looking to go if you're just like, I want to tell Asian stories 100% authentically. If you're not Asian, you probably can't do that 100%. But as you consume that media, as you hear their stories, as you connect with them on an emotional level, you're going to be a much better storyteller in general. And I think and that's, you, that's amazing. Yeah, and you'll also see that there are parallels between your own culture and Asian cultures too. You know, in, in, in many ways we're different, but in many ways we are also alike. Um, um, Amar, let, I want to get through this so then we can do our outro because um, the production team has just been honestly so incredible. I want to make sure really that great. we are punctual. Yeah, so oh, Amar, what, what is something that you would recommend to players who are trying to play Asian characters? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, do a bit of a swerve and say actually this. If you're Asian, you may, like some of us on the panel have, implicitly assumed that we have to play you know, white characters or like our elves have to be white or essentially, you know, like Lord of the Rings kind of a thing. If you're Asian, play an Asian character, play the culture that you know, play the culture that you're familiar with and you're comfortable with and bring that representation to your table for yourself. And even if I'm doing game, if I, even if I'm in a game that I'm not DMing, um, I will have my character be, uh, you know, usually brown, uh, even, and that's just kind of how it is. It's just, there's a brown, there's a brown elf now. All right, deal with it. And I'll also bring snacks that I grew up enjoying and loving, so going back to food. And I'll bring that element of my culture to the table. And, you know, people bring chips and stuff and I'll bring like spicy mixes. And it's a wonderful time for everybody then. Oh, it always goes back to food. Always goes back to food. Uh, oh my God, I'm now I'm hungry. <laughs> um, Pam, how about you? How, what what do you recommend to people? We have less than nine minutes left. <laughs> well, one thing that I would like to advise all of the the European and American folks here, the white folks here, is I've noticed that a lot of people I talk to always say my culture is not interesting. Um, please recognize that your culture is interesting. All cultures are inherently interesting. Your lived experience matters. And if you bring that to the table, that might help you, uh, that might prevent you from exotifying other cultures in your attempt to play it. So it's a lot of um, deprogramming and decoding to assume that something different from you is better when that is not the case. When you start like doing what Steve recommended, where you where you look at the media and you look at the stories being told by people that are not like yourself, you'll inevitably absorb these things and they become points of reflection. So first step, uh, decode the idea that your culture is not interesting and that ours is automatically better. That does not, that does not exist and that might help you reprogram everything about playing other characters. Nice. That, that's awesome. That's that's really important because a lot of people feel like I want to be different. I want to stand out. My culture is boring yep. when that is yeah. not the case. And I think taking a culturally relative sort of approach to character creation is just so and world building is just so important. Um, Ahmed, how about you? What, what tips do you have? 
I think that uh, you should try to explore things small and grow larger with time. Like you can start with something as simple as most uh, in most Western countries, you have a small family of two or three children with the parents. I come from a very small family of nine people. <laughs> so try to explore how 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 does that dynamic work? How does it uh, feel to to grow up not only with your siblings, but having a deep relationship with your cousins and your second cousin and, you know, like three family trees away. Uh, try yeah. to pick something simple and explore it and give your character a chance to walk in someone else's shoes and try to see the world in their uh, point of view. Amazing. Yeah. I incredible. And, and I think it's just so important. All of you had different answers. I think this is you know, why I'm so grateful that Pam, you are up at 5 a.m. in Manila. <laughs> and Ahmed, it's like, was it like 11, 11 p.m.? It's midnight? Almost midnight. Almost midnight. And then Amar and Steve, you know, it's like 5 p.m. where we are. Um, so you know, we, we have, you know, a lot, of, a lot of energy left. Pam, you, you need some sleep. Um, now, uh, <laughs> we're running out of time. We're running out of time. So one of the things I want to do is I want to, you know, have all of you do a sign off. Where can people find you on the internet? What are you doing? I'll start with myself. Uh, the conversation, even though this panel is ending, the conversation doesn't end. Uh, so for the next hour, you can find me on Twitter at Daniel H. Kwan. It's, it's like right there in the overlay. Uh, I'm just going to do an AMA. If you want to ask me any questions, let's have a conversation with our community. Um, so that's what I do. If you want to, you know, purchase my games. Uh, if you want to learn more about Asian culture, check out the Asians Represent podcast. We have the Dungeons and Day Asians actual play where we actually talk about creating Asian characters in 5th edition D&D in our Session Zero episode. Uh, you can find my games at danielhquan.itch.io. Uh, Steve, let's do this. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter. My handle's down there. Uh, I think in the next couple of, of weeks, I might actually be doing a lot of more post about self-care and not so much about you kind know, of racially charged ta tabletop RPG issues. But that said, if you're looking for kind of my my own voice as I, I examine Orientalism and whatnot, uh, I am I join Daniel uh, every Friday on uh, the Asians Represent Twitch. Uh, it's AZNS Rep on Twitch, uh, where we do a live reading of Legend of the Five Rings with some other professionals. Um, it is a <laughs> it's a very <laughs> it's a trip uh, it's a trip it's a trip i'm, I'm not going to say any more than that because we'll go over time but if you're looking for more of these conversations uh you can definitely check us out over on our twitch channel uh it's every friday at 7 p.m eastern time yeah and we you know we also have a youtube channel youtube.com slash azns represent where you can watch all of our critical analysis of D, D products amar where can people find you on the internet we are running out of time Make it quick. Uh, you can find me at Amar Ijaz on Twitter. Give me a follow. Uh, I'm one of the hosts of Asians Represent, so definitely check us out there. I'm one of the uh, cast members in Dungeons and Asian, so you can definitely listen to our uh, actual play, especially where we look at D&D &D, uh, and use that as a system. We, I'm also facilitating the uh, Critical Read al Kadim, where we're working through al Kadim in sort of two-hour chunks every third Saturday of the month. And you can follow the previously streamed episodes on our YouTube channel that Annie already mentioned. Awesome. Pam. All right. I'm the Dovetailer. I'm the Dovetailer everywhere. So you can find my games on Itch. You can also find me on Patreon if you choose to support me. I may be doing an Ask Me Anything as well on Twitter. And I will definitely do a thread on all of the RPGC people that I know along with their stuff. So just come talk to me. Follow me anytime. Awesome. And then Ahmed, how about you? Uh, you can find me at uh, 20 Arabia RPG. I'm always on Twitter. Uh, and I want to say, if you are, if you have ever played uh, Arabian Adventure, hit me up. I want to hear about your experiences. I want to explore the uh, era of how people played it and enjoyed it. And I'm hearing so many great stories and I want to hear more. Awesome. I, I love how you're just so open to people telling their stories and sharing their experiences with a product that you know portrays aspects of your culture. Um, we are out of time, but I just want to say, you know, Steve, Amar, Pam, Ahmed, I appreciate you all so much. Thank you for, you know, joining me for this panel, and thank you for the audience. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for listening. Thank you for learning with us. Again, the conversation continues. Find us on Twitter. Ask us questions. 
Um, we are happy to help. And this is all about education and this is all about moving the hobby forward. This is all about taking a game we love, making it better and making it more inclusive to people who look like us and beyond. All right. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.